everyone. So this is Theo and my colleague. Oh, I'm Morris. And um, let's get started. And this is our content. So first, this is our specification. So we there's some um, like key factors to keep our power low, which is like we choosing the input control as big as possible to lower like lower or uh, to minimize our uh, overdrive voltage. And so by picking the uni uh, overdrive voltage as low as possible to get the um, largest GM uh, with the rather low current. So we got the highest efficiency by choosing lowest uh, overdrive voltage. And also to further minimize the power consumption, uh, we of course have to use the largest current meter M factor to um, lower, uh, lower the biasing circuit power. And I will demonstrate how we um, design the, our circuit. So first we start from the output stage um, and then the voltage cascode stage of the amplifier. Then after designing this, we observe the largest current, or largest size, transistor size of all of the amp uh, gain stage of our uh, gain stage and then divided the transistor size by 20. Then we can determine uh, our current mirror uh, current, and then we start to design the constant gym circuit, mirror this um, current to our battery battery, and then final tweaking to make um, the final result. So let's start from the output stage. So um, we start from considering um, the uh, phase margin and our unity gain bandwidth. So uh, since GM9, the output transistor, uh, is a key factor to our second pole, which um, the second pole is important because if uh, typically we have to choose second pole like uh, like a decade ago, uh, for a decade far from our unity gain bandwidth, so that we have phase margin like over um, at least um, forty five degrees, but. Uh, so that will make our GM9 very large, which uh, our current will be very large on the uh, output stage. So to minimize that, we, m we have to move uh, this pole to much more further inside Unity back and with. So by doing this, we have to design a zero uh, to, to uh, eliminate this pole so that we have a flat um, bow plot. Uh, that will not hazard our um, phase margin. So by doing this, we can decide the GM9 and we can decide the current of upper stage. And then by designing a RCCC uh, using a pole three, so um, like the upper stage is completed after this. So, and then we can work on the um, for this cascode first stage. And then by, we can decide on GM3 by using the uh, unity gain bandwidth equation. And then the first stage of the gain is basically determined. So next one, uh, we have to design the, the middle part, the RO generator, as I mentioned. And this one is pretty easy because um, like the bandwidth is not really important for this um, project. We care about the unity band gain bandwidth, which is um, a gain, uh, which is constant because um, it is gain times bandwidth. So a so we can make our really large, which um, our current can be really really small, like um, a couple hundred nano um, amps. So after this, we can we finish our. Um, our gain stage, and then, as I mentioned previously, divided the larger transistor size twenty by twenty, and then we get we can get the idea of um, our biasing circuit current, and then by this equation, uh, we can design out our uh, complete circuit, and then of course fine tune it.
So now let's just go on to what's the magic behind this low power. Okay. So as you can see that because this project we are using like two states and we have a little capacitor which is like in between two output stages, right? And first you just get rid of the RC first. You just focus in on the CC first. So we know that by putting a CC there, your omega P1, which is the dominant pole, is going to be extremely small because of the fact that the gain of here is very large. And the CC doing the middle approximation is going to be like here, right? And it's going to, for example, the AV2, for example, must be approximately like 16 gain, gain intervals to 16. And for this product, the omega P1 must be very small. And we know that there's omega P2 here. Everyone knows this point, right? And this can be approximated as GM9 over CL. And since that a CL has been given as 10 picofarad, so that we will think of like to do, in order to increase, to like hold this phase margin, we know that the first dominant pole, after you encounter the first dominant pole, you're going to lose 90 degree of phases, right? So the main issue is that, how can we just like retain these phases at least under 25 degree before you reach into the unity gain bandwidth because we want to have at least 65 degree of phase margin at the unity gain bandwidth. So as a monkey, you will think of, oh, just by doing pole splitting, we can just make omega P2 as high as possible because you know that if two poles splitting too far away, you know that you, can, you are going to get a good, very good phase margin. However, how about the power? Like, you know that we are, this is directly proportional with each other, right? You want to make omega P2 higher, you are costing GM9. And just by assuming that the, your omega P2 lies at your unity gain bandwidth, which is like 30 megahertz, you still need at least 188.4 microamps to do that. Even you, though you do like GMID sweeping or stuff, it's not going to work. So instead, we decide to make omega P2 even lower. And then why, why can we still remain the phase margin? Because there's a omega, there's a pole three, which other team mentioned this before. And like this is not actually happened. I would not say this is accurately to mention omega P3 here because this omega P3 actually lies in the transfer function. You need to derive this nasty transfer function and then came up with the idea of, okay, it's one over C1 and RC. And however, it is a very good approximation to assume that this C1 mainly comes from the Miller approximation of this M9. In other words, you know that the CGS9, like the parasitic capacitance, is, in, is directly proportional to the width and the length, right? And by making this width and length very small, in other words, the C1 is very small. Even though the RC, for example, you can put RC to 3 million ohms, it won't actually affect your omega P3 because of the, of the fact that the C1 is very, very small. So our omega P3 can always be at least 90 megahertz. To, do, to, uh, to realize the post splitting. So you can see that by doing this, so we are decided to put the minimum width and the minimum length of the, of the N9, so that the only current passing through here is seven micro amp. So up to now, there's already a 300 micro watts apart from the design. So let's look at our faces. You can see that our omega P2 is lies in the middle and the dominant pole is there, right? And our phases is very beautiful. You can see that it's, it remains this until the unity gain bandwidth to drop. In other words, our omega P3 here is very, very large, larger than the unity gain bandwidth to retain this phase margin after even it passes the unity gain bandwidth. So that this is our dominant pole there, right? And here is where we do the pole zero cancellation. And this is the unity gain bandwidth, and this is the omega P3. So why not we just keep decreasing omega P2 to just save more power, as I mentioned before, because eventually it will be canceled, right? However, we found that if omega P2 is too small, or even like the two poles are too close to each other, then the RC approximation formula will be far off. And many groups mentioned that they just sweep RC, right? But actually in the virtual so when you are setting the RC parameters, you can just put RC parameters into this. And then you just get your CC and your RC will automatically, automatically set. You don't need to tune every time. This saves us a lot of time doing this. So we decided to, because it is, we just want to make a rigorous approximation that two poles will not be too close with each other. So I decided to make two decades apart. We know that we lose 20 decades per decade. So it's like minus 40. So in the middle right here, you can see that we still have at least like a minus, minus 90, in other words, like a uh, like around around 80, phase, uh, 80 degree of phase margin in the middle, and then passes to the end. So you can run the pole zero analysis. This is a very good, I think it's very good uh, simulation for you to get an idea. You don't need to hand calculate every time. You can see that the pole here 
perfectly cancels out with each other. So that's why our base margin is perfect. And the trade-offs. So we know that to increase the unity gain bandwidth, you can just make CC lower, because you know that the GM3 over CC is the unity gain bandwidth. However, this will trade off your base margin and your power. And you increase the base margin, you just make it just opposite, right? And you can make L9 even lower. For this example, I have already made this lens into the lowest, like 0.18 lens. So this is, our design is pushing to the limits, cannot be lower. And the trade-off is that the unity gain bandwidth is gonna be lower and the power is gonna be higher. And to decrease the power, the main issue is just to make the ID lower. And this will trade off the bandwidth and the base margin. And to increase the, uh, the gain here, which is not the case actually, because there's a trade off, like, even though it has a trade off of unity gain bandwidth and base margin, but it's trivial here because we know that, we all know that the telescopic telescope provides high enough AD1. You just think of because there's only 70 dB in this project, right? So 70 dB is around like 3,000. And this stage have like a 16 or 15. And it's just need only like gain equal to 200. And that's enough. So that you don't need to have a large L. However, at the end, I still use a large L in the middle branches. Why? Because I just want to make the current lower. So actually, when we finish our design using 0.18 lens over here, we can get a gain of like 80 dB. But that's not important. We just want to have low current. So we decided to make a lens here larger. And as a result, there's like a 7 micro amp here and 3.2 there and only 0.6 between these branches. So I think that's the key where we have a low power right here. And this is a GMID analysis. You can see that at the left part, it's just the substantial. But in this project, we are, we are being restricted to just have the VOV of at least 150 uh, millivolts, so which is here. So we bias in all of our, all of our uh, input stages here. However, we still push this to the limits that for these input stages, we want, to, we want the VGP to be lower just to have a better GMID efficiency. And the power here is being calculated here. So the comments, the merits, I think the merits of Fordicus code is that uh, you can see that in this picture, right? You have two independent branches of setting the current. You have one current mirror here and two current mirror here. So those two are independently. You don't have to, if you want to have a higher GM, you don't need to increase, you want to increase ID, right? But you increase ID, you will increase this ID too, if this is not a 4D code design. However, since we have a 4D code design, this doesn't matter. You can have a independently set up to save a lot of power from the cascode stages. And uh, for the cascode, of course, offers like a good input common mode range and without losing a lot of swing. And for 100 mm technology, I think Professor do use the PMOS for input, right? And I think it's just for old uh, technology, for new technology, we can use actually a MOS or PMOS to do like a power reuse strategy to make it better. And the fourth point is that I will, I will try to bias if there's no restriction, I will bias the input stage into substratio just to decrease the input referred noise. So that, yeah, it might be better. And more ideas to work on, yeah. Run, just run a noise analysis and calculate the total input referred noise and run the Monte Carlo in four corners in different temperatures. Yeah, and that's all, thank you. All right, let's thank our group. <laughs> And what was your guys' final power? I don't remember if I saw that. Oh, 23.7. 23 microwatts. Um, questions from Apple? Um, yeah, so I, I like the trade-off slide that you have. Uh, very nice one. Uh, uh, so uh, you mentioned the power. Sorry, can you repeat again the power, the total power? Yeah. Do you have a table? Oops. Oh, 23.7 more. So um, you mentioned there's a trade-off. Yeah, I'm trying to, to look at the rest of the numbers, uh, like the phase margin and... Um, you can see that the phase margin is 65.65 degree. Oh, so it's on the... <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> and again, it's 74.4. Uh, okay, got it, yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, and no more questions from my sec. And so, uh, Smoke, do you have questions from yours? Um, no, no questions from my side. Yeah, good, good talk, good presentation. Uh, I liked your focus on optimizing the power and kind of uh, burning more power in the output stage rather than the input stage. 
which helped you in this prioritization. So yeah, overall, good, good. Thank you. All right, questions from our present audience. Uh, okay, so the question is that your colleagues' the question is that. <laughs> uh, it's actually, how fast is my final sizes for the M9? It's actually just use the, because we want to have the minimum of parasitic capacitance of C1 to make omega P3 larger, as large as possible. So I decided just to make, just to make the minimum width and the length of it. Yeah, but that might cause noise because the width and length is too small. Might have trouble in there. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our group one more time.